So how does MIT make a decision which student to let in, which student they don't let in? And that admissions officer said, the first cut is typically done by reading letters of recommendations. But many of our students don't pay attention to the importance of the letters of recommendations. They wait till the last minute, then they scramble to send the requests and not provide the detailed enough information. So I was talking to a dear friend just two days ago over dinner, Julie Mont Montgomery. She has written letters of recommendations for 500 plus high school students. And she said she got so many requests in October, November timeframe, and some of them simply do not make a strong impression for her to write an amazing letters of recommendation. So today we will draw down on how to request letters of recommendation from your teachers, your coaches, your mentors, etc. And how do you build a rapport during your high school years with these people that will actually affect your college admission in a very significant way? What information do you provide? And what are the follow-ups you should do before and after the college application process, respectively? So we're very fortunate to have Chris O'Connor to join us today. Chris did his bachelor's degree at Dartmouth and the MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. He worked as the assistant director of the admissions at Dartmouth College. He also worked at NYU and the Yale in program management. So Chris brings a wealth of knowledge he will be sharing with us today. So with that, Chris, um, take it away. I will let you present the slides and we'll start. Great. Thanks so much. Let me just uh, turn on my screen one moment. Everyone, and thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to speak with you today. As Rebecca mentioned, my name is Chris O'Connell, and um, I have uh, a lot of different experiences in, in higher education, but first and foremost was an admissions officer at Dartmouth College, where I went to undergraduate uh, uh, as well. And uh, since then, I've spent a lot of time at different universities, working all over the world, with Yale University in Singapore, with New York University in Abu Dhabi, and uh, most recently here at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so I'm really pleased to speak with you today about a topic that is really important to me as someone who has read thousands of undergraduate applications to some of the most selective schools on, uh, on the earth is, uh, is about letters of recommendation. And as Rebecca mentioned, it is an area that a lot of folks don't pay as much attention to. Uh, and so hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that and uh, give you a, a better sense of what this means and, and why it matters. So uh, here's a little roadmap of what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. So the title of today's session, as you probably noticed, is Cultivating Compelling Recommendations. So we're going to start off with a big picture view. What's the purpose of a recommendation letter? Why does it matter? Then we'll look a little bit into the admissions officer point of view. My core colleagues and I, we discuss this at length at all the schools I've worked in. And uh, we have a really clear sense of what matters and, and what doesn't in the letter of recommendation. So I'll share some of that. Then we'll talk a little bit about action steps that relate to you or your children with regards to building relationships with teachers, with counselors, mentors, et cetera. And then we'll talk about a few strategies to move from typical, which is like Rebecca mentioned with her friend at dinner the other day, so many letters of recommendation fall into that category, just typical and ordinary. How do we move from typical to compelling, to interesting, to part of your application that really helps you uh, move from move into the admit pile of the application process. And then finally, we'll talk really specific tactics about re requesting recommendations. It's always the hardest part, it can be a little awkward. So we'll talk a little bit about how you think about that with regards to your teachers, counselors, and others. And lastly, I'll end with a couple uh, next steps and a, and a sense of a timeline. I know everyone's at different points in their journey, and so we can talk about what you need to be thinking about across high school. And then, of course, at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. So, a lot, of, a lot to cover here. We won't get to go into everything in super fine detail today, but really excited to uh, take your questions at the end as well. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Why do letters of recommendation matter? 
on one hand, you might be asking yourself, you know, my, I'm applying to college or my student is applying to college. Why do other people have to be involved in this process and put in a lot of work? And the reality is the letters of recommendation are a really helpful tool in terms of adding context, providing us with some academic insight and helping differentiate your application. So what do I mean by that? It means that the letters help us understand what are your accomplishments, what is your impact in the context of your high school, in your community, in your city or town or state or country. And that looks different across every applicant and we depend on teachers and counselors and coaches and, rec and uh, mentors to help us decode what does it mean that you were the, you know, for example, the president of XYZ club in your school and how is that different from maybe other students and how they spent their time at your school. So that context piece is really important. And this is why we look to the letters to, to give us that. Secondly is the academic insight. So we know your grades. We probably know your test scores. And so, you know, but that's, there's a lot of students with great grades, great test scores. So what really makes you tick and what makes you stand out in the classroom? So this is why we really wanna hear from your teachers who tell us a little bit about uh, you know, what kind of student are you? Are you very engaged? Are you really curious? What are some of the struggles you've had in the classroom, if any, and how have you overcome them? So it gives us a little bit more of a story that helps us pair that with your grades, your academic transcript. And that gives us a much clearer sense of who might you be at our university as a student. And then the last piece is differentiating. So as I mentioned before, lots of students have great grades, lots of students have good SAT or ACT scores. So the letters of recommendation really are a chance to have your story be told from a different point of view. And that's where we look to these teachers and counselors to shed some more texture, interesting anecdotes, uh, a little bit of your personality even in many respects. And that helps your application stand out and, uh, and gives us a little bit more of an understanding of who you are as a person as we think about the admissions process. So that's why it matters, and that's why it's part of almost every university's process is to ask for letters of recommendation. And you know, the next piece I'm about to say will vary a little bit by school, but generally you need three types of recommendations, or you can think about it in three different categories. There's a counselor recommendation. Typically that's just one, one letter. There's teacher recommendations, and typically for most schools that's two teachers. And then there's a supplemental recommendation. And I put a little asterisk next to that one because some schools will say it's optional. Some schools might have a, might request a supplemental letter like from a coach or um, an advisor or something like that. And, uh, but most schools will accept at least one extra letter. And that letter is really intended to provide a new perspective. I will say though, just to be totally, totally clear, the counselor and teacher recommendations are the most kind of universal across all the different schools and their processes. So typically your counselor recommendation or your advisor recommendation, uh, that helps us update your school. You know, what courses are offered and uh, what's the graduation rate at your high school? Your counselors give us a little bit of that big picture perspective. Your teacher recommendations is really the meat of this process. And that's where we want to hear from at least two. Uh, often we want to hear from teachers who are teaching you in core academic subjects. So that's foreign language, English, or language arts, social studies, math, and science. And uh, we ask that those two teachers really shed some light on who you are uh, in the classroom and, and out. And so all in all, the benefit of this is that these letters of recommendation, they lend legitimacy to your candidacy. You're putting forth a lot of info about yourself, your resume, your essay, and uh, these letters, are kind of a third party way to, for admissions officers to really understand, you know, is this, is this serious and how serious is this? And, and help us understand your application in total. So that's the big picture and that's why these letters matter. And they're really crucial to the process because they paint a much more rich picture of who you are as an applicant. And that's really helpful, particularly at schools that many of you might be interested in where there's thousands and thousands of very smart and really well, well qualified applicants. These letters make us, uh, help us make dist distinctive decisions. Okay, so let's move on a little bit to what do admissions officers think about when we're reading these letters? So in my previous life, reading applications, part of the admissions committee at several different schools, we read thousands and thousands of letters of recommendation. And I will tell you that many of them, 
a significant number of them are very similar. They're talking about different students, of course, but they're very similar. And the reason is most of the time students don't necessarily build relationships with those teachers. So the teachers just don't have a lot to say. And it's not a mean thing. It's not a bad thing. Teachers are busy, students are busy, but it doesn't offer us what we're hoping for when we're looking at a letter of recommendation. What we're not looking for is amazing writing quality from your teachers or counselors. So when you're thinking about who to ask, you're really asking people who know you well, not necessarily the teacher who has the most beautiful writing or the most amazing credentials or resume. So often I've worked with students or heard from students who ask the teacher to write their recommendation because that teacher went to Harvard or that teacher has a PhD or that teacher is you know, seen as really smart. But instead you need to be asking yourself, which teacher knows me really well? Which teacher can actually share some interesting uh, anecdote or conversation or relationship that I've built with them over the last year or two? And uh, because that's, that's what matters most, it's the substance of what they're saying, not how fancy they are. Uh, secondly, and this kind of relates to what I just mentioned, is that we're looking for examples, anecdotes, really specific scenarios and situations that bring me as the reader, as the admissions officer, into the story so I can understand this is how you interacted with your history teacher, or this is how you participated on the basketball team. And that's what helps me kind of get a, a, a closer look or a better sense of who you are as an applicant. And finally, what we're looking for is praise. Most of them are praise in these letters. You generally get positive letters of recommendation. Praise that offers context. And so here's an example. I'm gonna pick on Becca, this example student I've, I've illustrated here is, Becca is exceptionally hardworking and passionate about her education. She was the only student I've ever taught who improved her grade from a B minus to an A plus in one semester. So you can already tell in this letter that, of course, that first sentence, it's pretty nice. She's hardworking and passionate. That's awesome. But what really helps this letter stand out is this teacher is saying that this is the only student they've ever taught in their whole career that's been able to pull off an, a great improvement in that short of a time. So as an admissions officer, that tells me something much more interesting than Becca's a hard worker. I have a real clear sense that in the context of this teacher's career, this school or this community, that this student, Becca's accomplishments is really outstanding and really, um, really distinctive. And so that's what we're looking for in these letters is context from your teachers that help us understand what it means that, you know, uh, what all of the things you've done in high school really mean. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. So I'm gonna move on briefly with sticking with my example of, of Becca, our, our illustrative student today. Um, I'm gonna to read with you, or share with you, excuse me, two case studies. And um, this is a pretty realistic and illustrative example of what I typically have encountered in the letters of recommendation I've reviewed over the years. So on the left hand side of the screen, this is a sample of a letter of recommendation that is nice and standard. On the right side of the screen, it's the same student and the same teacher, but it's a much more compelling recommendation. So I won't read it to you directly, you can read it on your screen, but briefly you can see on the left hand side that this letter is really nice. It, this teacher is saying, Becca's great, she's really smart, she's really curious, she's always turning her in her assignments on time, that's always good, and she's someone who will really succeed in college. So that's really great, but the reality is that's most applicants to top universities. And so as a result, I read that letter and I think nice things, but I don't necessarily learn anything new about that particular student. What's really helpful is a letter like the one on the right and a couple key phrases I've highlighted there for you, but that this teacher actually says in my 12 years of teaching, this student is the top 5% of the students I've ever taught in AP Calculus. And so already I have a sense, wow, okay, this teacher is uh, not just saying she's nice or she's smart, but really qualifying what that means. And this means that this teacher has you know, 12 years of teaching. That's a pretty good judgment and pretty good track record to highlight this particular student. What I love the most about this letter though, is that it provides an anecdote, an example, something I as an admissions officer can understand and relate to. So this teacher says, when I taught the class about differential equations, Becca was the only one to ask questions, even though every other student was really confused. So for me, as an admissions officer, I read this and I think, 
this person speaks up when they're when they have a question they're not afraid to ask for help those are really great qualities and that's definitely part of the things we're looking for in the application process the next part of the letter i think it really stands out and and gives me something to kind of anchor my evaluation on which is that this student organized weekly study sessions to help some of the first year students in her class who were stressed or falling behind. And that's the type of thing that gives me as an admissions officer something to work with when I'm making my evaluation, I, my recommendation of who to admit, to say to my colleagues on the admissions committee, this student isn't just smart. This student isn't just curious and able to you know, ask questions when no one else will, but she actually helps other people in the class as well. She's thinking more than just herself. She's thinking about those around her. And I have this story to really prove my point. And so all in all, this letter on the right-hand side, it's a little longer, of course, but it really does a good job of giving me a clear sense of uh, you know, what, what the student is like in the classroom with a clear, tangible example. So that's what we're looking for. And this is a, a pretty good illustration, in my view, of, of what can make a letter, like on the left, go from nice and standard to on the right, really compelling to stand out. So we'll move on a little bit to talking about what can you do about this? So I've shared a little bit about what admissions officers value, what we're looking for in the letters of uh, recommendation, but they're not letters you write. So, you know, what, is, what's, what, is, uh, what are some steps you can take to actually, you know, uh, improve this process? So there's three pieces here. So it's, you have to begin early. It's never too early to begin building a relationship with your teachers or counselors. I know some of you on the call might be early in high school, maybe eighth, ninth, 10th grade. That's great. And this is a time where you could practice getting to know your teachers, um, getting to know your counselors. If you've never met your counselor, this is a great reminder to, to reach out to them this summer or early this fall. If you're a junior or senior and you feel like, oh, you know, I haven't really spent time getting to know my teachers, don't worry. It's not too late. And frankly, teachers are busy people too. They have a lot on their plate. And so this is a good reminder to you that you can still reach out, whether it's this summer over email, or waiting for the fall semester to begin and get to know them, share a little bit about what you're interested in, what you've enjoyed about the classes you've taken, et cetera. Secondly, it's authentic interactions that really are crucial here. Teachers are busy, as I mentioned, and so you know, simply just talking to them for the sake of talking about letters of recommendation or college, re or college applications probably won't do much in terms of giving them a positive impression of who you are as a person. Here's a few steps you could consider taking. You don't need to do all of these. These are a few ideas. You know, you could seek extra help or resources from a teacher. So maybe you're really enjoying a class, but maybe you're, you have a couple questions. Asking them for ideas where you can learn a little bit more, online resources, books they'd recommend, et cetera. A second one is you could share some interesting articles that you found on your own and say, hey, I thought this was a great video that relates to what we talked about in class. I wanted to pass it along. And the third is you can volunteer to help with some of the school activities that they may be involved with. Many teachers are sponsors of clubs or events or after school programs, and that might be a chance for you to get to know them on a more informal or personal level. So I'm not recommending you need to do all of these things all at the same time immediately, but these are just a few examples of ways that you can build authentic interactions. So thinking about what Rebecca said at the beginning, instead of asking for your letter, you know, a few days before you need to do, you're really building a foundation with these with your teachers and counselors. So when the time comes in the 12th grade to ask for a letter, they know who you are, they like you, hopefully, and they have a lot of uh, stories and interactions and examples that they can share. So just to summarize briefly where we're at right now, the goal right now for you as students and perhaps parents on the line is that you want to start practicing this. It's not easy. It's not easy to talk to your teachers. They're the ones responsible for grading you. It might, you might be a little intimidated. That's totally fine. So if you're earlier in high school or in middle school right now, this is a chance for you over the next few years to practice engaging with your teachers beyond your regular classroom interactions. They're here to help you. They're here to support you. Most teachers really value getting to know these, getting to know their students outside of the regular assignments and tests and homework. So take advantage of that and invest in those relationships because that's really what lays a crucial foundation for letters that are much more interesting and much more compelling and more helpful for you in the process. Okay, so we're gonna move on and talk about a couple key strategies for your letters. So here are three 
specific strategies that help elevate your letters from standard, like that letter on the left we looked at before, to compelling, like the letter we looked at on the right of the screen earlier. So the first, I'll walk through them in, in brief, and then we can always, of course, take questions at the end about this. So the first strategy I'll share is you want multiple touch points with the same teacher. Some of the most interesting letters of recommendation I've read in my career have been teachers who've taught a student in ninth grade and then taught them again in like 11th or 12th grade. And what I love about letters like that is the teacher's able to say, I taught Chris when he was brand new to high school. Maybe, you know, he was falling behind or maybe he didn't have great time management skills. But when I taught him in 11th grade, he really matured, he really grew. And here's, that one. here's an example. And those letters where a teacher knows you in more than one way, those are really interesting. They're able to comment on your development, on your growth, on your maturity, all things that make for a really strong, really interesting letter. Second strategy is focusing on the growth improvement letter versus the success letter. So what do we mean by that? All too often, students think, I'm going to ask the teacher to write me a letter in the class that I got a 100% grade, an A plus, or the class where you felt like you really understood the material very well and you, it was your easiest class. So for example, I worked with a student a few years ago who was applying to a school I was working at who only wanted to get the letters of recommendation from his science and math teachers. He was really good at STEM. That's what he wanted to do. And he thought that, that made the most sense. Those are the teachers who could say he was a slam dunk, awesome student, you know, every, always got 100% on every assignment. What I encouraged him to do, and based on my own experience reading these, is that sometimes a letter from a teacher who saw you struggle a little bit is much more interesting. The number of letters I've read in which the teacher says, Cindy's a great applicant. She got 100% on every assignment and she's awesome and I recommend her. That's nice, but I already know your grades. I see, I see your transcripts. And so that's not really telling me anything interesting, certainly nothing new. And it really misses an opportunity to share about what you've done to, to earn those grades. You know, what work did you invest in or what effort did you have to go to, to to get those good grades? So I'd encourage you to think about letters of recommendation, perhaps from teachers who've seen you struggle a little bit. Of course, it still needs to be a teacher who likes you and a teacher who, you know, you've built a relationship with. But some of the most interesting letters are ones from a student, excuse me, one from a, a teacher who's taught you maybe a class where you didn't immediately love the material. Or maybe it was a class in which you uh, had to really work at it. You had to go to a lot of extra tutoring or extra help to really do well. So in that student I worked with a few years ago that I mentioned, uh, who wanted to get all of his letters from science and math teachers, he ended up getting one letter of recommendation from his English teacher. And he really wasn't great at English when he started in high school. It was a second language. He was struggling with the writing. It was a lot of research and a lot of composition. And I think what made the letter so much stronger was that this teacher was able to say, I know that the student is a smart kid. I've seen him in his other classes. I know he gets great grades, but he really had to work for this A in my class. And it took a lot. It took, there was, you know, there was tears, there was, you know, endless nights, et cetera. And that's a much more interesting letter then simply, you know, he was a, he got a great grade. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. That's the second strategy. The third is thinking about your letters as pieces of a larger puzzle. So when you think about the application, and for those of you who've attended other webinars here, you've probably learned about other parts of the application process, like your essay, your resume, et cetera. You need to think of your letters of recommendation as parts of this big puzzle. So for example, if you're gonna write your essay, about your science fair experience and your science fair project. That's a great topic potentially, but perhaps you don't also need to ask the teacher who was your advisor for the science fair to write a letter. And the reason I say that is sometimes that teacher will probably say something very similar to what your essay will be about. So you have to be strategic. If you're already going to cover a particular topic or experience or accomplishment in your essay or in your resume, you might think about asking a teacher who would have a different point of view or share a different perspective on you. So I'll give you a quick example. A student I worked with at one point was an exceptional dancer. They were really like really uh, elite in, in their, their preparation for dance. And they were applying to, applying to Yale actually. And um, you know, they have a great uh, performing arts program, et cetera. 
and uh, they want they were writing their whole essay about their experience in this elite elite uh, training that they did for dance. And they wanted one of their letters to come from someone who was, you know, a close uh, instructor and coach for them over their high school experience. What they ended up doing instead, though, is realizing, thanks to I think some conversations with my colleagues in admissions, is that perhaps an essay that's all about one activity is redundant if the letter of recommendation is coming from someone who also knows you in that same activity. And so it might be a chance to ask someone who knows you in a different angle. So in this particular student's case, they were a really strong history and economics a student in their high school, but that wasn't really a huge part of their application persona, their application identity. But what they ended up doing is getting a letter of recommendation from their economics teacher, who was able to shed a totally different light on the student. So then when I'm reading this person's application, I get this incredible essay about dance and how important it is to their success. But then I read a letter of recommendation that says, you know, she was a brilliant economics student as well. And that combination gives me a really good sense of this is a very well-rounded student who not only has excelled in one thing, but has really, you know, hit some success milestones in, in a number of different activities or interests. So the, the brief recap the last one is really just think about your letters as part of this larger puzzle. And you, you can actually think about asking recommendation writers who might know you in different angles or different perspectives to help complement the rest of your application, the essays, the um, interview, the uh, resume, et cetera. So these are three particular strategies. Again, you don't need to do all of them per se, but these are three ways you can think about how to move your letter recommendations from interesting and nice to really strong and compelling in this process. 